let's move on to uh, let's move on to some of the footage from yesterday. Uh, we want to obviously bring that to everyone. Uh, this is footage from Israel, from Ashkelon yesterday of the Iron Dome. Uh, if you're listening to the podcast, just an incredible shot of the Iron Dome intercepting Hamas rockets over Ashkelon uh, just from just from yesterday. Um, Ryan, that is in the broad daylight. You know, it's something that we see every now and then, of course, but really, really something uh, to see that happening uh, over, you know, residential areas like it was yesterday. Yeah, and the Iron Dome was was really overwhelmed on Saturday just, yes. by, just by sheer numbers. And it, it just became a math game that the Iron Dome can, you know, shoot a certain number of uh, m missiles in a minute. And if there's more than that, that's it. Like, that's, that's the math. The, the, and the only way they can ramp that up is by getting more launchers, you know, and and somehow perhaps speeding up the reload time, which is going to be, which is, you know, at some point that's all, you can only reload so fast. So, uh, you know, by launching like 5,000 of them on Saturday, they were, they were able to overpower that. And I wonder if the, in the, in this era of, of the Iron Dome and of their, their mass surveillance, because Israel has pioneered the the most sophisticated kind of cyber surveillance technology out there, Pegasus being kind of the most famous of them, which you know can get into your Android or your iPhone without you even clicking anything. Mm. Um, famously, I think they, they used it on uh, Saudis, licensed it and used it on Jamal Khashoggi. And Gaza has been known as one of the most surveilled areas in the world. Mm -hmm. And so the combination of the surveillance plus the Iron Dome plus this uh, sophisticated technological security barrier that was outside of Gaza, which included unmanned machine guns linked to uh, linked to cameras, linked to uh, right. you know, yeah, just just the, the the most over the top kind of sophisticated technology you can imagine, kind of pr probably then lulled them into a sense of hubris yep. and allowed then Hamas to counter strategize say, well, okay, well then we're not gonna use phones and you know, we're, we're going to annihilate this technological uh, barrier with just drones mm -hmm. that were, if you, if you saw some of these videos, the drones would go up and just drop a grenade right. in there and take the communications offline. Right. So, you, so now you've taken this thing offline and, and now your unmanned machine gun is just com is unmanned and unroboted. Right. And you, and you can then take a bulldozer through the fence. Right. And yeah, the, we were talking earlier about the level of intelligence failure. Um, a lot of people saw yesterday, we can put this next element up on the screen from Kafar Azza, um, just sh stunning, stunning, shocking images from a kibbutz that was uh, just brutalized. Uh, there was an I-24 report yesterday, so that's Israeli media, uh, that suggested a very specific number of babies were decapitated. Now, this is not confirmed. That specific number was could not was not confirmed yesterday. Um, what was confirmed, CBS News, uh, Nora, Nora O'Donnell said that there were bodies of uh, decapitated babies recovered in the area of this kibbutz that was Again, the only way to say it is just absolutely brutalized. You see this screen, uh, you see this quote um, from the Reuters article that starts, a baby's crushed crib lying outside a burnt home, corpses strewn on streets, body bags lined up on an outdoor basketball court, the stench of death everywhere. Just a few days ago, this was the sleepy scenic kibbutz of Kafar Azah, an Israeli farming community of about 750 people, many of them families, with young children. Now it's become a charnel house after Hamas gunmen burst out of the Gaza Strip on Saturday and laid waste to the village. Ryan, the extreme virality of the I-24 report led to this really, I think, unfortunate situation yesterday. On the one hand, a journalist's job is to fact check extraordinary claims, especially when they're coming uh, from uh, the IDF, from a government essentially, which is what I-24 was sourcing their report to. Um, on the other hand, getting into this conversation about how many babies were decapitated is not a good place to be. Yeah, the whole, th so an I-24, so people understand, is is uh, you know cl uh, cl is known as closely linked to Netanyahu, closely linked um, to the Israeli military. It's, it's not known as kind of a dispassionate, independent, source of news. It's it's the first place that 
the Israeli military is often going to go with with propaganda. And so, but your point is, I think, a good one in that you're, I was confused at the entire nature of this this debate here. Mm -hmm. um, because on the one hand, you had some people on the left who were saying, look, the deaths of civilians, this is what decolonization is. Like, this, yes. is, this is what it looks like. Yet when this particular atrocity was floated in, in a completely kind of unverified way, everybody said, well, no, no, that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it really lifted the veil and showed that actually, okay, at least, okay, there is humanity there. Like, you do care about atrocities. I agree with that. I think that's an interesting take because to me, as someone on the right, the left, I think, has this reasonable um, fury when Western media takes uh, talking points from the Israeli government and regurgitates them as though they are automatically the uh, sort of verified truth. And I think that frustration is what... Uh, I think brought us to the point yesterday where people who were on the one hand saying this is the uh, reality of decolonization, this is what it looks like, uh, but on the other hand, we're saying this, you know, we, we don't know uh, that the story is true. We're coming from that place of, you know, I-24 going viral and what do you do? Like I-24 said something that doesn't make it automatically true. And that's, yeah. again, like it's just not a good place to be in when the reality is that and and you know the reality is that that village was brutalized was was flattened um, and as Nora O'Donnell came in with unfortunately last night that there were recovered uh, decapitated babies that uh, were were found it was just uh, even with Nora O'Donnell's report there I'd, I'd still want to see some more details and I mean I actually don't want to see yeah, any no, more no, details no, but yeah. I'd want to see more corroboration and more verification because it's it still doesn't scan but to me. You don't need any of that in, in the sense that what Hamas was doing in this village and others was horrifying. Yeah, like right, they were going right. door to door in some cases right. and finding civilians in their homes and killing them yeah. or capturing them. Like that is horrifying enough. Yeah. Like so yeah. e even if, as I think eventually we will, this kind of decapitation of babies thing is debunked, that's not necessarily something to celebrate because you still are left with a horrifying massacre. Murdered babies. Right, right. It, right. Murdered at minimum, babies. At minimum, at minimum. Right, yes. yes. Murdered babies, um, Holocaust survivors taken hostage. I mean, there's there's just nothing. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I, I'll add a French journalist said she cross-checked images of the, I, mean, I don't even want to keep saying the phrase. Which the fr yeah, the, and I saw that French journalist's post that was like, just un completely unconvincing. I didn't. It was in, it was odd. Yeah. Um, so here's a, w what I was going to say is that on the one hand, I think the quibbling over the numbers and the veracity of the story, um, which Sky News had an interesting conversation about, is coming from this very real and legitimate frustration that some people have about Western media running with um, the sort of gospel, you know, whatever the IDF is saying or whatever Netanyahu is saying as true. On the other hand. I think for people like me on the right, um, sort of people that are, or, or people that aren't even on the right but are, are generally pro-Israel, the frustration came from, well, why are we quibbling? And that led some people to say the story must be true, if that makes sense. So like, the, it's it's this like very visceral right. frustration that you know, why is anybody trying to, why are people so aggressively trying to cast doubt on the story when, as you said, Ryan, like the level of atrocities here. Are, uh, manifest for everyone to see. Why are we quibbling over the number? Um, and so I think those sort of two visceral reactions were what was butting heads yesterday. And I think the stakes seem to be that the more that each side can, can if if the if the Israelis are able to dehumanize uh, Hamas in particular uh, to a complete extent, then there are some that believe that that then completely takes the gloves off. Right. That right. when people say, "Well, look, you're killing you're killing babies with this wanton destruction right. of a, of a civilian population," then they will say, "Well, how's it feel? Mm -hmm. Like so, it take take you know, eat it. Mm -hmm. Like this is this is your revenge." Right. And and so it feels like there is a kind of propping up of some of the the like 
most over the top, you know, uh, atro atro atrocity propaganda that you can get to, to then justify, ironically, like the exact same thing, mm -hmm. like the deaths of thousands or maybe more than tens of thousands of children. Because the, something like uh, a million people in uh, Gaza are under are 15 and under. It's almost half the population. Yeah. Almost half the population. So you're gearing up uh, to annihilate thousands or tens of thousands of those children. With no so, stakes, who, who, who don't understand the state. They're, who have, they're not and, old enough to understand and, who have never, and, and who, take a the, the position. The overwhelming number of whom have never been able to leave Gaza. And that's what you like when... When the news said that people broke out of Gaza, like that should have been a clue to people. What do you mean they broke out? Broke out. Are they in prison? Well, oh, they are in prison. It is a prison. That's a, so th we have video here from um, MSNBC yesterday of a reporter talking about this question. Mm -hmm. We discussed earlier in the show, a quote from the New York Times that I'm going to uh, reread after we watch this clip from MSNBC about what people uh, in Gaza were hearing from uh, the Israeli government. There is a network of tunnels underneath Gaza City built by Hamas. It's how they move military hardware around. And you can bet that those Israeli hostages, those 150 or so people, are likely in those tunnels. They are likely spread out across the network as Hamas tries to make it as difficult as possible for Israel to rescue these hostages who are seen as such valuable bargaining chips. Um, in terms of how Israel goes about reducing civilian casualties, they say that they use very precise intelligence before they strike any specific location. I've been inside Gaza when Israel has been bombing, and you meet Palestinians who say that their phone rang, and on the other end of the line was an Israeli military officer telling them in Arabic, we're going to strike your apartment building because there is Hamas infrastructure in it, but we want you to go door by door first and make sure that there's nobody inside the building before we strike. In some cases, they can stay on the phone for an hour, making sure that the building is empty before they bomb it. But as I said, Jose, it is simply the reality that when you drop high-powered explosives in a place as densely populated as Gaza City, that there will be civilians killed. Yeah, I thought that was a, actually a really good report there, because on the one hand, and this is again from the New York Times, we read this quote earlier in the show, Israel has given broad warnings for people to leave certain neighborhoods or towns, but has acknowledged they are not as extensive or specific as they have been in the past, and many residents say they have not received them. Gazans say they have nowhere to go anyway. So some people yeah. get, yeah, go ahead. And, and what that reporter was talking about, just to be clear, is previous bombings. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been in briefings uh, with is, Israeli Defense Force here in Washington that say that they can also send mass text messages right, right. To, to a building before they bomb. They also do what's called a tap. Like they, they'll they'll drop a very low uh, explosive on the roof of the building as a as a warning. Right. Like okay, if you miss the text messages, if you miss the calls, like boom, like get out, get out, and you, you hear that and, and they get out. But that's before. Like it's not clear that they're doing that this time because the 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 amount the volume of explosives being dropped and and the sheer expanse uh, and scope. Uh, is is unprecedented. And the mingling of civilians mm -hmm. hostages with Hamas, which is always a challenge. Um, you know, if you if you take Israel charitably and say that they're they're trying to minimize mm -hmm. civilian casualties, um, I mean either way, that's an enormous challenge because of the, the urban, densely packed nature of Gaza, of the West Bank. I mean, that is just incredibly diffi difficult um, already. But now, that's why I think this New York, New York Times quote is helpful. It says that even Israel has acknowledged they're not as ex extensive or specific right. in this space as, as they have yeah, been in the past. they're not trying. Uh, yeah. let's, let's roll this next element. Um, this is footage from, you know, what, it, so we're gonna do a voiceover here if you're listening. Uh, just, uh, again, uh, use this word earlier, brutalized. Uh, Place of Gaza here, eastern part of Gaza, uh, that has been completely flattened. Um, you can see in some of that rubble things like teddy bears, uh, it's just, it's just completely, completely awful. And previously, one of the safest places in Gaza, uh, reportedly. Yeah, and it's it's also setting up all sorts of places for snipers and other militants to hide. Oh yeah. You know if 
the expected ground invasion does come. I, a couple comparisons yesterday being drawn to Fallujah, but on a much higher level. Mm -hmm. um, you can look at like Aleppo, I think already. We have some examples of what this could look yeah. like and it is horrific. Right, yes. It, right, and it wouldn't be the first time that something that Israel is doing out of kind of anger and, pro and to project strength and force ended up backfiring. Like so, like let's like let's say that they level this area, I see all saying. of these different areas, I see. and end up creating kind of sanctuaries uh, for snipers mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and other fighters who mm -hmm. then are able to then um, stave off an invasion. Yeah, because it, it's not guaranteed that the invasion is going to be successful. You know, they've called up three hundred thousand people. Um, the war in Lebanon in two thousand six did not go particularly well, or whenever, man, I'm going to get the years wrong. War in Lebanon, another war, and another ground invasion of Gaza, um, you know, did not go as well as the Israelis would have would have liked it to, because the advantage is always on the defending, to the, to the defending force, the mm -hmm. ones who can hide behind walls, run through tunnels, um, against the ones who are, you know, exposed and, and moving through a city that they know well from satellite imagery, but don't know as well from having lived in it their entire lives. And let's run through some other updates here. We can put the next, next element up on the screen. This is from the AP, um, reporting that an Israeli airstrike has killed 19 members of the same family in a southern Gaza refugee camp. We can go to the next element as well, B6. This is from the New York Times. Israeli airstrikes hit marketplace and mosques in Gaza, killing dozens. The strikes also hit two hospitals, schools, and infrastructures, the UN said. Now, uh, this is B6. We can just go to the next uh, element. We'll roll through these so you, you get a glimpse into what's happening. At least six Palestinian journalists have been killed in Israel's bombings of Gaza. That's from Al Jazeera. And then finally, the next element here from the Times of Israel. Uh, this is a big one, Ryan. Israel has been said to bomb Rafah crossings to Egypt after telling Gazans to flee through it. The Messenger reported this as well. Uh, actually, there was a, a strange situation yesterday where an Israeli spokesperson went out and said people can get to Egypt through Rafah and then said, the Rafa section is actually the Rafa crossing, crossing is closed. Did you see that right. happen? Yeah, and then you saw right, and you, you've seen some video emerge of, of people who are at this uh, crossing getting bombed. Yeah, um, right. And so, but at, at the same time, Egypt is not here for that either, because one of the big fears of uh, of Egypt, Jordan, other other countries is that Israel was eventually going to continue the displacement that, you know, the, the, the Gaza is as populated as it is because of displacement, you know, previously. And so the thinking was there's going to be a crisis that leads to uh, the border getting opened up with Egypt and millions of people getting pushed out of Gaza uh, and into Egypt and Israel, quote unquote, solves the Gaza problem that way by just completely cleaning it out mm -hmm. of Palestinians and then rebuilding it and populating with Israelis. And so the, uh, Egypt is, has always been, you call it paranoid or not, they have been uh, on guard for that. And so there's not a situation where Egypt, you know, now that maybe there's a, maybe there is a humanitarian crisis that gets to such a level that Egypt does eventually uh, succumb to that and allows it. But Egypt is also uh, a, a dictatorship basically that is afraid of its own shadow, is afraid of every civil society group that operates in its, within its borders, is afraid of uh, anybody with any, like even remote links to the Muslim Brotherhood. Like the last thing that they want is two, two million people that they feel like might cause some internal instability and right. would. Right. Like that you're, like you're going to have instability as a result of that. So e Egypt is, uh, does not wanna uh, open up the border. Yeah. Enormous instability, uh, you know, coming that, that will have ripple effects, of course, into into Europe, into the United States, all throughout the Middle East. By the way, hundreds of people were killed in Afghanistan when an earthquake hit this week as well, um, and that those always cause right. mass refugee situations. Um, so again, uh, there's going to be so much uh, ripple effect from all of this in the years to come, which we'll talk about in a bit.
Hey, if you liked that video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to Breaking Points. If you want to see the rest of CounterPoints, go to breakingpoints.com to become a premium member and get the full uncut show every morning in your inbox and on Spotify. Help us build independent news and get the full show every morning at breakingpoints.com.